Eastern State Penitentiary opened in 1829. It was just not a place for prisoners, but also for rehabilitation and the first of its kind. This episode is also a first of its kind. Normally you see me make elaborate meals. This time around, I'm gonna portray the food that was served to the prisoners right here in Eastern State Penitentiary in the 19th century. Be my captive audience for this taste of history. Wow, spectacular. A Taste of History is made possible by Sandals Resorts, the luxury included vacation. So, for the trip to the Eastern State Penitentiary, I've researched diligently and found five one pot meals or stews, you might want to call it, that I'm going to show you today. Potato and smoked ham, chili with red beans, white bean and beef, the lentil stew, and we have the lobster. The first stew we're going to make is the lobster potato cabbage stew. That is extremely well documented. There's a memo that was sent out to all the wardens of the prison to stop serving lobster more than twice a week. Just imagine, lobster now is a delicatessen, it's been for a long time, but in the 18th century it was used as bait. I have a pot already in the fire that's boiling away. I'm just going to get some of the root vegetables into it. Carrot, parsnip, and some onion, and then I have some cabbage, and a couple of cloves of garlic, whole, and this goes in the back to my boiling stock with a little bit of lobster shell in there to enhance the flavor. There is no sweating or no simmering for this particular dish. Put it back on the fire. I got the corn, I got the potatoes, maybe 15, 20 minutes until the potatoes are done. The lobster, which I already pre-steamed, I'm just gonna chop it in pieces. Last moment, when everything is finished, put it together, check for salt and pepper, and we're ready to serve it. Well, it's a mess, as you can see, but it's a good mess because it tastes delicious. So since I pre-blanched the lobster, it's not completely cooked, but it's pre-blanched, I'm letting it sit here until my stock is completely ready, potatoes are done, vegetables are done. Now, the next dish I'm making would be most likely the one that would have been served most often. It's called potato and smoked pork. So what it does, it's almost the same thing in principle as the other one. Basically, we chop some onions, coarse. So we have some carrots and some onion. Again, rough chopped. Just a little bit of celery root. Just cut a piece off here. A little bit of cabbage. From all the research I've done, cabbage was a big time ingredient because it grows at least twice a year, if not more. Now, I got the smoked pork, and I'm sure the ends and pieces they would have gotten, like so. I already cut some pre-diced. Put it right on top there with a couple of garlic loaves in it. Let's go to the next part, which is right across from the lobster that is still simmering. There we go. So now let me enter the potatoes in here. Those potatoes will cook until they disintegrate. All I gotta check later is on salt and pepper, and I'm ready. Take a look at that. I think prison food wasn't so bad, especially if I would have made it. <laughs> but. It's interesting, not expensive in there. Expensive spices were out of reach. Matter of fact, I actually think the salt was not used too much because salt was really expensive in the 18th century. Prisoner can complain. Eastern State Penitentiary was the world's first true penitentiary designed to instill fear and regret and penitence in the hearts of its inhabitants. During the early years of colonial America, 
Punishment for crimes like theft or assault were typically served by public humiliation or banishment. Jailhouses were seen as holding pens, small, dark, overcrowded cells infested with disease, vice, and corruption. To many, minor infractions were often equivalent to a death sentence. In 1787, in response to the critical need for reform, some of Philadelphia's most influential thinkers established an organization that was to become the Pennsylvania Prison Society. Inspired by Quaker ideology, the founders advocated for what they believed was a more humane treatment of inmates, rehabilitation through solitary confinement and personal reflection. The founders of the Pennsylvania Prison Society, they believe that everybody has an inner light and if given proper respect and human dignity and good living conditions, that even people who had broken the law and were incarcerated could reform, become penitent, and go on to live law-abiding lives. As a result of these beliefs, Eastern State Penitentiary opened in 1829, a groundbreaking new form of prison inspired by the word penitence, which is to show sorrow and regret for having done wrong. When they opened the prison, it was really an experiment. They didn't know what would happen. This was a radical new intervention into criminal justice practices. This Gothic-style fortress was one of the most influential buildings of its time, boasting advanced mechanical heating systems, plumbing, and even running water. Its hub-and-spoke design would be the model for hundreds of future prisons worldwide. All throughout the 1800s, thousands of people visited Eastern State. It was really a remarkable architectural feat of engineering. While this new social experiment drew praise from many, it was not without its critics. Charles Dickens visited in 1842 and wrote very strongly against the Quaker method of isolation, even going as far as calling it a dreadful punishment. For certain people, their time here helped redirect them, helped change their lives, but in many ways it was a failure. We know now that separating people from social interaction makes it really hard for them to reintegrate into their communities. While the system of solitary confinement was eventually abandoned, Eastern State maintained operation until 1971. Throughout its existence, it housed roughly 80,000 inmates including infamous bank robber Slick Willie Sutton and notorious mobster Al Capone. Today, Eastern State Penitentiary interprets the legacy of American criminal justice reform in hopes of deepening the national conversation about this ever-important topic. I got a very good friend of mine, his name is Dr. Selig that supplied me with a tremendous amount of information about prison food, but mostly in the Caribbean, not so much in Philadelphia. I got a little bit of that, a little bit of here, but I did know that chili, as we call it today, red bean chili was often eaten. Now, in the spirit of that, if you look at this ground beef in front of me, you can detect there's a lot of fat in there. I would assume that during those days they would tell the wholesale butcher that supplied the prison, eh, make it 60-40. Our days, it's like 80-20, meaning 80 lean and 20 fat. This is about 55-45. So what I'm doing right now, I have a dutchie and a fire. I'm adding in some oil. Let it get hot, it's getting hot already. The ground beef. And I'm just gonna let that cook up really good. You can smell already how the, the fat is rendering out. It's just what you want. While this is cooking over here, I'm getting ready to slice the onions. So the onions, I would make really a coarse dice, not, not too fine. So here, the onion and the beans, when they cook together, it's the binder. So I got the garlic, I put it right in here, ready to chop. So let me look at the, oh, look at that. Rendering perfectly. Ground beef is just a little bit more fire. And then I add the garlic and the onion. Beautiful. I have a little bit of tomato paste, which most likely would have been a stretch in those days, but hey. I have no but salt or pepper in any of this much later. So now I'm 
putting in the beans. And now, it's gonna get a couple of ladles of water. And now, it's gonna get some chili powder on top. It'll take about, uh, maybe half an hour. Gonna see here. Oh yeah. Hmm. Tell you what, it's actually very good tasting. I struggled, I honestly struggled with those recipes because not much information is there. But I will say, depending, if a good chef was in prison, you would have gotten that. If they had me in prison, it would have been the same way. But who knows who was doing the cooking. Annie, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Same, welcome. I've never been to prison, so maybe you can help me demystify the Eastern State Penitentiary, can you? I'll do my best, yes. <laughs> Thank you. We are standing in the center surveillance hub at Eastern State Penitentiary. All of the cell blocks radiate out from the central hub. It was all about surveillance and silence and solitude. So a guard could stand in the center hub, basically keep tabs on the whole penitentiary. Just walking into the front gate, you just feel the, the heaviness and then you envision what went down here, you know? You can get a sense of all of the stories that lived behind these walls. We think that there were about 80,000 people who lived here over time. And as you probably noticed, it's a huge medieval Gothic looking facade. And it was intended to instill fear in the hearts of people passing by, that they would never want to break the law. They would never want to be a prisoner in this building. Well, and I think they were successful at that, wouldn't you think? Because even today, when you drive by here, it still gives you the chills a little bit, It no? really does. Do you want to check out some other parts of the building? Love to. So chef, we are standing in cell block seven. This is one of the original seven cell blocks of the penitentiary. It was finished in 1836. What's impressive to me, it's a marvel of construction. Just think about it. Yeah, it had running water and flush toilets before the White House That's even what did. I understand. So it was really architecturally magnificent. The original philosophy behind this penitentiary was all about solitude and surveillance and um, separate confinement. They were led into the penitentiary hooded so they couldn't get a sense of their surroundings and also so that their faces would not have been seen by anyone else. The thought was that folks would come in here, they would serve their time, they wouldn't be known to anyone else and they would be able to leave and get a job or re-enter society a little more smoothly. Do we know how, how much time they got out of the cell during this era, do we know? Prisoners would have been living in these cells 23 out of 24 hours a day. They had two half hour exercise breaks. Just imagine spending your entire life in this cell 23 hours of the day. In the 1830s, when the prison was just taking off, uh, prisoners would have bathed maybe every two weeks or so. They weren't allowed visits from family and friends. They weren't allowed letters. The guards wore socks over their shoes, so when they walked through the hallways, the prisoners couldn't hear them. It was a really isolating existence. You maybe remember what you did to get in here, right? Right. So Chef, we are at Al Capone's cell. He's probably the most well-known prisoner who was ever incarcerated at Eastern State Penitentiary. He was here from 1929 to 1930. He was, of course, a bootlegger and gangster in Chicago, and he was incarcerated here for carrying a concealed deadly weapon. He was given the maximum sentence of one year here at Eastern State Penitentiary. Philadelphia police really wanted to nab him and show their muscle that they had caught this gangster and incarcerated him so quickly. He was definitely a privileged inmate. His cell is actually on the wrong side of the gate. So if anything happens in the cell block, he's kind of protected. He's close to the guards, he's close to the center surveillance hub. So this is a really prime spot to have your cell. If you had money, you had means. Exactly. This is a perfect example. He decorated it pretty nicely in there. It's pretty nice. There's a really nice rug on the ground, there's a painting on the wall, there's a cabinet radio playing waltzes. He has a really sweet spot in this location here. The flavors that come off the heart is unbelievable because everything has its own flavor, cooking together and driving me crazy. I'm telling you, I don't believe it. But anyway, next dish we're making is white bean and beef. So the beef that I'm using today is basically just what we call a, a chain of the tenderloin. So if you wanted to make this recipe at home, you want something that has a good marbling in there, like you see here. The marbling gets the flavor. Most people don't realize, they ask me all the time, uh, I use something that has no fat on it and gets no flavor, obviously. 
the fat that gets the flavor. So actually I should be very tasty. Oil. I'm sure this amount of beef would have most likely fed a whole cell block. <laughs> if they're lucky to get a piece in there. The potatoes I'm adding in there would just be cooked until they're completely disintegrated as well. Garlic right on top. <laughs> the flavors. First time I taste officially have this much flavor coming at me because I got already four different stews behind me. Each one with its own flavor profile. Mind buckling. All right, onion goes in. All right, onion. Put the onion, the garlic into it. I don't need to sweat it anymore, then it's already there. Now I'm adding the white beans and the potatoes go right with it. Now remember, those potatoes will disintegrate, which is the idea. Water. When the prison opened in 1829, the overseers would bring food right to the prisoner's cells and they would feed them through a small feeding hole they'd pass th their tray through. The dining halls were opened in 1924. Uh -huh. So this is when the prison had shifted to a congregate model. Gotcha. So people weren't alone in their cells anymore. They were able to leave their cells. As it evolved. Exactly. I got you. From my perspective, they had to have a serious uh, organization skills to make that all happen. It's not simple be between procuring, between prepping, between serving it, between cleaning it up, mm -hmm. the amount of stuff. But then I would assume stuff was easy because they would have just grabbed as many inmates as they needed, no? Exactly, right. And I think that being able to work in a kitchen like this might have been kind of a premium job because you could have been out of your cell for a lot of the day because as soon as you stopped cooking breakfast, you'd be right on to cooking lunch because there were so many mouths to feed. Yeah. Plus you get to nibble, it's like in my kitchen. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> we know that sometimes coffee or potatoes or different food things walked away from the kitchen and then were distributed throughout the prison. For a little extra. For, for uh, a little cash. Yeah. It was like a little side hustle a, that a, a prisoner might tip. have. <laughs> yeah. For the final recipe, which is number five, is the lentil stew. Now lentils would have been eaten a ton of times. I'm putting a little bit of root vegetable in there, just a tad, a little carrot, parsnip, chop the onions really coarse for this one here. Don't try this at home, by the way. I'm not responsible for your finger. Here we go. And the lentils are here. Everything goes in together for this particular recipe, no oil. The lentils have been pre-soaked overnight. And you can use any kind of lentils. This happens to be the regular, good old American lentils. The potatoes go in there. And just now, water. The lentils too, normally, or most of the time, would be eaten without any meat. So you wouldn't saute or sweat the vegetable because it's all cooked together. The addition of sausage would be maybe, maybe not happening. I just have some kielbasa here that later, the last moment, I slice up and add it to the stew. So lentils, by definition, is a great source of vegetable protein, and that's how you cook it. Remember the lobster we cooked in the very beginning? This is going to go in the pot behind me. All right, just put a little water into it. Want to get a little steam action going. Give it a couple of minutes to let the water evaporate. So now I have the lobster ready. The stock we made early with all the vegetables in it goes in there now. Potato, corn, some root vegetable, a little bit of uh, green cabbage. Oh man, look at that. I had an exciting time making all this recipe for the Eastern State Penitentiary. It gives me great pleasure to kind of dive back in history with a lot of research that was delivered, so I feel very comfortable that this recipe would have been close to as they would have had it then. Now, as I mentioned earlier, flour, very expensive, so I'm just now mixing cornstarch or arrowroot in a bowl with cold water. 
So the Kronstadt slurry, which is the official name, I'll use to tighten up four of the five one-pot meals that I prepared for Eastern State Penitentiary. So the first one I'm going to do is the potato. Next one is the white bean and beef. Next one is the lentil. As you can see, when I add the arrowroot or cornstarch in there, it gives the proper thickness. And now the last one is going to be the lobster. That's going to go in this pot over here. Look at that. See how perfect? Now it's the fun part. Okay, so it's just the potato and the smoked ham. You see how the potatoes are all dis disintegrated? Number two. Beautiful chili with red beans. We got a fantastic white bean and beef. And we have the lentil stew that we finished with a few slices of kielbasa. And obviously, the pièce de résistance, our lobster. Beautiful. So this is my interpretation of what Eastern State Penitentiary would have served their prisoners in the 1800s. So Diana, one thing is for sure, I never wanted to be a prisoner at the Eastern State Penitentiary, oh, I'll tell you that. that. makes two of us. <laughs> oh, but in any case, it was an eye-opening experience examining and touring the Eastern State Penitentiary, which is supposed to be haunted. I didn't see a ghost personally, but so I'm told. I didn't see a ghost, I didn't see a ghost. I didn't see a ghost personally. <laughs> oh. right there, I just get early days, you know, locked up in your cell. 23 hours a day, you got a little, got a little food handed you under the door, rough days. But yeah. I did find in the research that occasionally, maybe, who knows, maybe the 4th of July, maybe Christmas, they would get a little shortbread. That's right, and there's only four ingredients in yeah. this one, so it's hard to mess up. If you're making this at home, not for your prisoners, I would suggest high quality ingredients. So, starting with some nice room temperature butter, as you can see, this one is very soft. And to that, we just have some powdered sugar. Uh, it's been sifted, so there's no big lumps in there. I'm gonna dump that all in at once. And you want those two, again, to come together really nicely before you add your flour so that there's no sugar pockets, which would just melt out in the oven. It's nice when the butter is so soft because it just melts together perfectly. Okay. All-purpose or cake? All-purpose all flour, purpose. yep. And a whole And I'm bunch. sure the flour wouldn't have been this color. <laughs> Probably not. Would have been a little darker, yeah, maybe some flecks of things. Yeah, but wouldn't have been bleached. No, we have the, the luxury today of using this beautiful white flour. So we have that. And just a pinch of salt. Mm -hmm. uh, you can knead it with your hands a little bit. And then uh, just you want to refrigerate it until it's nice and cool. Or this dough lasts in the freezer for, I would say, up to six months, honestly. So As long as the sentence. <laughs> as long as your sentence. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is now a yeah. nice moldable ball of dough. Let me see that. Oh yeah. Nice and soft. And this one, this one you can feed to the kids. There's no eggs. So we're just gonna push this together and put it in the refrigerator for at least an hour until it's nice and firm. So it's you manageable. Want a rollable texture, exactly. Away that goes. And lucky for us, we have it I've done that part. So I'm just gonna flour our board here and we'll just push it down, roll them out. I would assume that they were skimping a little at the oh, present. Oh, I'm sure. And it was a treat, you know? Yeah, exactly. So even one was... Well, one sure. thing for sure, they all had good teeth, no sugar. Mm, that's one way to do it. <laughs> so we're just going to cut these into rough squares. They don't have to be absolutely perfect, but... And you could certainly, you know, if you're doing this at home, use some fancy cutters. By all means, shortbread hold shape very well when they bake. And I'm just putting them over here on our parchment lined sheet tray. Um, and then I'm going to uh, refrigerate them one more time. And stick them in the beehive and, and stick done. them in the beehive. How and much time and temperature for those cones? Uh, 325 for about 10 or 15 minutes. They don't take very long, especially with it at this thinness. So there, let me, let me check one of those uh, short breaths here. Yeah. Boy, amazingly beautiful though, huh? Not what bad for a prison what? cookie, huh? <laughs> wow, delicious, huh? All that for a taste of history from Eastern State Penitentiary. A Taste of History is made possible by 
Sandals Resorts, the luxury included vacation. For the past 10 years, I've gotten so many requests for recipes for my show, A Taste of History. Well, now you can find my favorite recipes in the Taste of History cookbook.